I'd like to welcome Matt Hells and you all to the live question and answer session of the seminar. Please ask your questions in the box on the screen and we'll ask the most popular questions. So if there's one you'd really like to see answered, then please use the upvoting function. Thank you so much for your talk, Matt. And our first question is, what is known about the contribution of non-coding de novo variants to developmental disorders? So that's a, it's a really interesting question, actually, because we can use exactly the same kinds of methods that we've used to investigate individual genes contributions to looking at non-coding um, contributions. One of the challenges is that many of non-coding elements are individually smaller than genes. And so we have less power to detect enrichment in any one regulatory element. But we, we showed a couple of years ago that if one looks at patients with neurodevelopmental disorders and one looks at regulatory elements that are active in fetal brain and are highly conserved through evolution, that one can see uh, an enrichment of de novo mutations in those patients. We estimated it may account for somewhere between one to 3% of the undiagnosed patients. Um, and then more recently, we've done a, an updated analysis of that using whole genome sequencing from the 100,000 Genomes Project. And that, that again comes up with about the same number. So we can see there's a burden and excess of these de novo mutations in non-coding elements, but tying down individual elements as being a cause of disease, we just don't quite have enough power yet. Yeah, thank and, you. And just to, to follow up a bit on that. So if I remember correctly, the DDD is, is based on exome sequencing. So, you know, do, do you think it would be productive to expand that across, for example, you know, whole genome sequencing or are there plans to do that? Um, or do you think that would yield many new insights? Yeah, so, so that, that, that's absolutely true. The exome sequencing that we did in DDD, we, when we designed it, we actually added in these ultra-conserved non-coding elements. Um, at the time, this was 10 years ago, we had no idea which elements were active in which tissues. So we just added in, in the top four or 5,000 elements. Um, and it was only then eight years later that we had enough data of the mutations and we could subdivide down to the ones that are active in fetal brain to see that signal. But because we'd only put, put on a small proportion of the elements that were active in fetal brain, we made some somewhat heroic assumptions to extrapolate up to that one to 3%. And it was only through looking at the whole genome sequencing data from Genomics England, where you could look across all of the fetal brain active elements, that we could actually say, yes, actually, it is it's more like 1.5, 1.7% of, of these undiagnosed patients have this as a cause. Okay, interesting. So I'll ask the, the next question. Um, so the, are there de novo variants that lead to developmental disorders that are not tolerated at early stages? So they're not viable, for example, in the zygote, but compatible if they occur later in development. So, you know, when you think about, I guess, that, that tree of cell divisions, are there ones that occur so early that you would never see them, but actually could occur later on and then would be compatible with viability? So, so that's a really interesting question because we definitely, we definitely know that happens because there are certain disorders that are due to activating mutations in, in certain genes. And we know that those genes are also mutated in an activating fashion in cancer. Uh, and one can use assays to determine how activating those mutations are. And one often sees the mutations that you see causing developmental disorders are more moderately activating, whereas the ones you might see in cancers are much more strongly activating. So we do think those are very strongly activating mutations that aren't compatible. Um, now, we, the, the challenge is that, you know, what fraction of cells can you sustain a highly activating mutation in? And is that fraction of cells so low that actually it's a real challenge to detect those variants in the first place? So we have done some work to try and dig into our, um, into our, into our exome sequencing data to try and see, can we see kind of mutations that we think are activating, but at very low proportions in, in, in all cells and therefore low proportions in our data. And thus far, we haven't found any kind of screaming kind of signals there that make us con you know, confident about that. But one would ha really have to sequence much more deeply and possibly even affected tissues to see if that's really happening. Thank you. Thanks. We've got a question from Gokhan Nalbant, who has asked, what do you, why do you think some rare diseases exhibit um, variable severity amongst kin? And are there 
modifier variants that are causing this? So, so we're, we're so the, absolutely this phenotypic variability exists, um, and we're trying to understand it. We think understanding it could be really important for thinking about how you know what therapies might be uh, important for these disorders. We can already see actually from quite old literature that uh, the genetic background of, of individuals is quite important. So for example, if one thinks about um, Turner syndrome, so Turner syndrome is, is um, one of the features of it is short stature. Um, and so, so the children are, are short, but if one looks at the stature of the child relative to the stature of the parents, one can still see that the Turner syndrome children of tall parents are on average taller than the Turner syndrome children of short parents. So clearly the genetic contributions to height in the general population are modifying the height in, in the child with Turner syndrome. So in that context, we think it's in, with height, it's very polygenic. There's contributions from thousands of variants across the genome. We do think there are likely to be kind of rarer variants that have larger modifying effects but they're really challenging to discover purely from a statistical perspective because the combinations of different variants that exist in any one individual is so vast. So, so we, think these that we think that genetic modifiers exist. We, you know, it's, it's certain that environmental modifiers will exist as well, and, and in particular um, genetic disorders in, in a particular you know, environmental context will be more severe than, than, than others. Um, so, so absolutely there are modifiers, some genetic, some environmental, and we'd love to be able to understand them better. We'd love to be able to understand the contribution of the in utero environment. But of course, that's a very difficult kind of uh, area of biology to study. That's wonderful, thank you. Yeah, it's very interesting. And there, there was another question here about, about genetic interactions modifying, um, you know, the, I guess the effect of, of the phenotype. And I guess you alluded to it, Matt, that, you know, from a human genetics perspective, there isn't that much evidence, as far as I understand, disease or certainly Mendelian diseases for genetic interactions modifying phenotypes. Is, am I correct in the thinking that? And, and equally, is that just a power thing or, or, or the way that we model the data that makes us difficult to detect these genetic interactions? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good point because we, there is a bit of a contrast between the model organism world where one can make you know, combinations of mutations and show that they have very strong genetic interactions and the human genetics world whereby the, you know, the, the exception is seeing an interaction and, and the, the general rule is that these things are kind of contributing independently. Um, there are a few examples of, of where there are in, interactions known and they're often you know, areas of where we really understand the biology. So for example, if you have a mutation in alpha globin and beta globin, then, you know, that isn't just alpha and globin operating independently. Um, sorry, I seem to have frozen on my screen, but hopefully uh, you well, can still, still hear me. Though, yeah. um, so, uh, so yes, yeah, so, so there, are, there are a few, but there are only handfuls of examples like that and, and a few kind of cases of, of so-called digenic conditions where you have to have the variants in both genes before you get the disorder. But they're, they're few and far between and, and, and difficult and, and sufficiently sparse that it's difficult for us to learn some really good general lessons. Yeah, no, fascinating. Because I, 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 I approach it for more on the experimental side, whereas you say it's much more clear, but so... It'd be nice if those two communities could kind of bridge that gap. But um, I guess the next the next question um, is thinking more about how do you know the efforts of DDD and Decipher how can they be used to develop treatments? And I guess one of the concerns is that maybe some of the developmental defects might be irreversible because they've happened at a, an earlier developmental stage. So I wonder if you you know how, what is the path forward? Do you think for some of these um, you know these disorders? Yeah, so I, I think the, I mean, the first thing to note is that there are, you know, well over a thousand different disorders that, you know, broadly categorized as, as developmental disorders. And there's a huge mismatch between the number of single gene disorders we know about and the collective bandwidth of the pharmaceutical community to kind of develop therapies to those. And so inevitably, um, focus tends to, to, to fall on, on a small number of disorders. So, the, but the actual need is much, much greater. Um, and I think there, 
one of the things that that is potentially demotivating for for pharma is the sense that these uh, are potentially irreversible. But that's that's often not from a very strong kind of empirical perspective. Um, there are relatively few experiments or few ways of doing experiments where one can test that out. Um, there's a couple of really good examples where it has been tested and, and um, shown that a, 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 a you know, neurodevelopmental disease is surprisingly reversible. So, so one example was done by Adrian Bird on um, a, a syndrome called Rett syndrome, where they made a knockout mouse, but the, um, the mutation in the mouse that knocked out the gene was reversible inducibly. And so uh, by uh, giving tamoxifen a drug, that induced the reversion of that mutation in the majority of cells in the brain. And when they, we, they did that postnatal reversion, they saw, saw it had a very strong effect on the phenotype. They saw a positive effect on the phenotype they saw in mice. Mm -hmm. um, now, that experiment has been done you know, to date on you know, a very small handful of genes, fewer than five out of those you know, thousand plus different disorders. So we're not in a very strong empirical position to be able to say that these things are reversible. Um, there are other kind of examples where, where um, you know, mouse models of disease appear to recapitulate the human disease and drugs have been used to have positive effects. Um, so there are a number of kind of clues that suggest it's well worthwhile pursuing. We shouldn't necessarily assume that they're all irreversible. Okay. And, 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 and just as an extension of that, do you have a sense of, so classically and in an oncology perspective, certainly, and you know, it's much easier to target a gain of function as opposed to a loss of function mutational event from, in terms of developing, for example, a small molecule inhibitor. Is there a sense, what is the kind of broad distribution of, you know, gain of function events versus loss of function events? And is that something worthwhile considering as well? Yeah, yes. So as I, I, th I think one of the slides I had in the talk said, you know, roughly of the diseases we haven't discovered, it's about 50-50 between loss of function and gain of function. We can, the pattern of excess mutations kind of gives us that clue. Certainly the most common disorders are the ones with the largest mutational target, and they're the loss of function ones. Um, I think the single thing that would, you know, revolutionize this field would be to have a programmable way of upregulating the expression from the existing wild type allele. Because it, in all these dominant disorders, you have two copies of the gene, only one of them is being knocked out. There is a normal copy of the gene. It's just that human biology is such that one copy isn't sufficient for, for normal development. Uh, but it does mean there's one normal copy of the gene there that if we could upregulate, has the potential to try and, and, and rescue um, some of the, the, the features of the condition. There are some technologies that potentially allow us to do that. They haven't been applied at large scale across cellular or mouse models. And I think I'm really excited by what that could, could, that could show. Great, thank you, very interesting. Thanks, Matt. There's a question here that um, sort of hypothetical, just asking whether the parental age and sex association with de novo variants plays out in cancer risk in the next generation? Has anybody looked at that at all? Um, not that I'm aware of. I think if one, if one, so new mutations tend to hit just one copy of a gene and there's always another copy of the gene. What we tend to know about um, DNA repair is that it's quite, uh, the genes that are involved in DNA repair are, and therefore uh, often caught, you know, if DNA repair is damaged, that often causes cancer susceptibility, um, is that you tend to have to have both copies of the gene knocked out. Um, so, so just having one copy of the gene knocked out, fortunately, DNA repair is quite resilient. Um, and so many of those disorders are recessive disorders. One has to have, um, you know, two damaged copies of the gene. So, so I think that that in some sense means that there isn't, uh, we at least haven't seen a strong kind of association between um, numbers of mutations a child has and their propensity to have um, cancer later in life. But to be honest, that hasn't been studied in great detail, in part because we've only been able to do these studies in the last few years. And so almost everyone who, on whom we've done these studies is under the age of 30. Um, so we don't have that longitudinal follow-up data. That's great. Thank you, Matt.
So Matt, we, we've got a question here that I think is slightly different than the other one. So I think it'd be nice to touch on it. Um, and it just talks about, you know, some of the work you've, you mentioned around using like gene editing tools to model the, the functional impact of these different variants. And I, I guess I wonder if you could just kind of comment more broadly some of the challenges that you would face doing that, because clearly some of these variants only function in, in very specific cell types or in very specific developmental stages or some of these proteins rather in very specific cellular stages. Um, and, and so what are the kind of challenges you see as you begin to try and model the functional impact of those variants? So I think there's, a, there's an ongoing debate um, in how, how biologically specific um, does a model of disease have to be for it to be useful? Uh, I think in many of the disorders we're looking at, especially the ones that we focused on in this, con uh, which have been the chromatin disorders in, in our work on generating cellular models and mouse models, which unfortunately I haven't had time to talk about. Um, and those chromatin disorders, um, firstly, those genes are expressed very widely uh, throughout the body, typically, and often through many different times during development. Uh, and the disorders that they cause are often multi-system disorders. So they often increase your risk of having a heart defect or a kidney defect, or they have induce a blood phenotype as well as neurodevelopmental problems. Uh, and therefore there isn't such a thing as the, the, the one correct cell type to look at. Um, and so we, we, we possibly to understand all of the phenotypic variability, we're gonna to have to study multiple different um, uh, cell types. But equally, if we just want to know, uh, does this variant in this gene uh, cause some kind of loss of function of that gene, then actually we have a range of different cell types we can choose from to, to, to do that experiment. So in some respects, by focusing on the chromatin genes, we're making life slightly easier for ourselves um, because we know they're broadly expressed and we know that that loss of function has a phenotypic impact on lots of different cell types. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. I realise we're almost at the top of the hour, so we should, I'm afraid we're going to have to start wrapping up, even though there's still questions coming in on, on the Slido. So I think we have to thank Matt Hells once again for his presentation and for joining us in this live question and answer session, and also you, the audience, for joining us at these seminar series. We're confirmed we're going to continue these seminars at least until summer 2021. So please look out for further announcements. Next month's seminar is April the 21st, where we've got Professor Nicole Saranzo from the Human Genetics Programme talking, talking to us. And just also please be aware that these seminars and the question and answer sessions are archived on these web pages for future viewing. And we've been delighted that we've been able to share Sanger Institute Science with, um, with a diverse audience all around the world over these last few months. So thank you once again, uh, Matt. It's been a pleasure hosting you today and, and we'll see you all next month. Thank you. Thank you everyone for your wonderful questions. <laughs>